to turn then with me to Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10. And we're only going to read a few verses tonight from here. And we're beginning to read, it's the second book of course in your Bible after Genesis, and so we're beginning to read at verse 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any for his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. And Moses said, Thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. There shall not an hoof be left behind. For thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. And we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go. Pharaoh said unto him, Get thee from me, take heed to thyself, see my face no more, for in that day thou seest my face, thou shalt die. And Moses said, Thou hast spoken well, I will see thy face again no more. We're going to focus on uh, the verse 23. Or at least we're going to take a thought for verse, from verse 23 that we read together. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place. For three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. And the subject tonight is light in our dwellings. Um, we're going to contrast and compare, which often, of course, is the Scripture's practice. And we're going to think about the light more towards the end but we're going to think a little while first about the darkness now you might be aware that there were 10 plagues that the Lord sent upon Egypt altogether including the Passover uh, where the firstborn were killed in every house by the angel of the Lord and uh, this one we're reading of here the darkness the plague of darkness was the ninth of those plagues um, there are those that would tell us that 10 is the number of completeness in the Bible uh, that you know it, it's completeness of a cycle and certainly in our, in our numbers that we use we go up to 10 and then we start again then we do 10 more and we start again and 10 is, is the completeness of a cycle and so 10 here were the plagues that um, were the number of the plagues that the Lord sent upon Pharaoh and upon the Egyptians and I can't rarely these days think of um, these ten plagues without thinking you need to turn there unless you wish without thinking of Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 1 because it seems to me this is so appropriate to what goes on in these chapters with Pharaoh he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that's without remedy this is precisely what happened um, in Egypt and Pharaoh was often reproved ten times he was reproved and after that he was suddenly destroyed of course we read about him hardening his heart constantly as well well you you would read about that wouldn't you were you to read all the the stories of the plagues so there are ten of them the tenth one is the Passover but the first nine come in three series of three and if you'd managed to finish my book Chris you'd have discovered that uh, I tend to give my books away in the hope these days that somebody might at least, at least read a chapter or two <laughs> but you'll find and we shall we'll look at it very briefly the details as I say are in the book if you want more details that there are three series of three plagues each 
making up the first nine and each of those series represents a different form of judgment upon the Egyptians the first three plagues um, represent uncleanness the second three plagues corruption and the last three plagues including the one we're going to look at a little tonight deception and indeed destruction destruction through deception so uncleanness the first three corruption the second three and deception and destruction the last three and each of these worsens into the next if they're not repented of so you know because Pharaoh had the opportunity when the rivers were turned to blood and the frog came up and the lice came up and so forth each time he hardened his heart the plagues got progressively more damaging and pro progressively worse until of course the tenth plague meant the death of every firstborn son throughout the whole of Egypt including Pharaoh's son of course and so the, the ninth plague that we've just read about here is the plague of darkness um, we have a New Testament comment on what spiritualism means in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened so there's the darkness and then down in the same chapter Romans 1 uh, in fact let's read verse 22 as well it goes on to say professing themselves to be wise they became fools and then verse 28 and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient and this was a darkening of the mind of course as it said there in verse it refers to the heart in verse 21 have a look also with me at Ephesians chapter 4 you've got 1 and 2 Corinthians then Galatians then Ephesians chapter 4 Corinthians of course follows Romans 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians and chapter 4 and verse 17 this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind having the understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart so there's a darkening again here the darkening of the understanding here the darkening of the heart in Romans 1 and also in Ephesians 6.12 across the page at page or 2 chapter 6 of Ephesians verse 12 we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world so this darkness that afflicts men this darkness that is upon the hearts and minds of men has a has a a heavenly source it has an extraterrestrial source if you will it has a spiritual source it comes from the rulers of the darkness of this world nevertheless it begins with a man himself and through his unbelief that is through his unbelief and ends with the power of devils coming upon that man and uh, it appears in these last three plagues in Egypt the last series of three the plagues of deception and destruction um, that the darkness is progressive so if we think about the seventh and the eighth and the ninth plagues we won't read about them all but the darkness is progressive um, now in the first of the last three plagues the plague of hail and fire darkness is not specifically mentioned but have a look at chapter 9 and verse 23 of Exodus where we read about the seventh plague that's the first in the last series of three the plagues of darkness if I can call them, collectively call them that uh, chapter 9 of Exodus verse 23 and Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail and the fire ran along upon the ground and the Lord rained hail 
upon the land of Egypt so the Lord sent thunder and hail now I don't think I've ever seen thunder and lightning where it did not also go dark maybe you have but uh, I would think probably like me I don't remember an occasion where we've had thunder and lightning and it didn't go dark at the same time no doubt when Noah's flood came the skies went black and uh, as that before those rains came down now although therefore darkness is not specifically stated in connection with the hail and fire I think it's reasonable to be inferred from our experience but the next plague after the hail of fire is the plague of locusts and if you look with me to chapter 10 of Exodus and verse 14 and the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in the coast of Egypt very grievous were they before them there were no such locusts as they neither after them shall be such for they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened and they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left and there remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field through all the land of Egypt so the locusts come they come in great swarms and the land is dark and I wasn't going to do this but I will um, that's it, I can find it quickly there are some historical accounts of um, the plagues of locusts I've got a couple of them in my book here and one of them I know is quite short so I'll just read you that historical account out of here Uh, this is a, from a man called Ladolphus going back to the 17th century but much more pernicious than these are the locusts which do not frequent the desert and sandy places like the serpents but the places best manured and orchards laden with fruit they appear in prodigious multitudes like a thick cloud which obscures the sun nor plants nor trees nor shrubs appear untouched and wherever they feed what is left what is left appear as it were parched with fire sometimes they enter the very bark of trees and then the spring itself cannot repair the damage a general mortality ensues and regions lie waste for many years so here's a man's testimony having seen I think he was somewhere in Eastern Europe having seen one of these plagues and he said the sky was darkened did you notice as we read in uh, chapter 10 there about the locusts and verse 14 um, and 15 and particularly verse 14 and the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt very grievous were they before them there were no such locusts as they neither after them shall be such that's great tribulation language does that ring any bells with you if it doesn't look with me um, where's my reference look with me to Matthew 24 Matthew 24 Matthew 24 in part describes the great tribulation I believe soon to come and verse 21 of Matthew 24 for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time no nor ever shall be what did it say about the locusts before them there were no such locusts as they neither after them shall be such and now let's have a look to Revelation chapter 9 we're into prophecy here just very briefly Revelation chapter 9 and verse 2 and he opened the bottomless pit and there rose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power so we have darkness here and we have locusts here now the locusts we read about there in Revelation chapter 9 I believe to be literal I do not think this is symbolical language um, and therefore something far worse I mean the plague of locusts in Egypt no doubt was awful but what comes up out of the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 9 
in the days of the great tribulation is far worse you can read about those locusts there in revelation 9 at your leisure and this is soon to come i believe upon a christ rejecting world and then in the plague tonight of course that we're considering there is darkness indeed the plague is so there's a progression it seems to me the darkness is getting progressively worse and then of course in the final plague the tenth plague we have the death of the firstborn on passover night and on that night israel as a nation were redeemed and they were physically set free and when the lord jesus comes at the second coming israel again will be physically set free from the antichrist and just as it was in egypt there will be a great darkness before the savior comes but what we're really thinking about tonight is not so much that literal darkness uh, that's to come in the days of the tribulation but the spiritual darkness that's already here one of the great present indicators to me of the imminent rapture of the church is the widespread rejection of the gospel noah preached for i, I believe he preached for 120 years and punctuated his preaching with the banging of nails into the ark he backed up his testimony that he believed there was a flood coming by building a massive ark for everybody to see but after 120 years preaching there was only him and his wife and his three sons and their wives and the general public took absolutely no notice whatsoever and as the general public grow more and more deaf more and more indifferent so we can be sure we're coming closer and closer to the final judgment and i believe i do believe that one of the great present current indicators of the imminent rapture of the church is the widespread rejection of the gospel as a young christian for a while maybe i might have been troubled that so few take any notice of my witness so few take any notice of my tracts so few take any notice of my preaching and yours too and as a young Christian, I would compare myself with Whitfield and Wesley and Spurgeon and many of those great men who drew thousands, and I would say, what's the matter with me? But then I read the Bible, and I saw Noah could only find eight souls, and they were his family after 120 years preaching. I find Isaiah was told to go and preach in the eighth chapter of Isaiah until there was no one, until the land was desolate. In other words, nobody was going to listen. I find Jeremiah ignored and thrown into prison. And so, yes, there was a revival. Thank God there was a revival when the Saviour himself came. But in the first century, by the end of the first century, great corruption had come into the church. Now, in the 18th century here in England, in the 19th century, thousands came to Christ Whitfield and Wesley brought thousands to Christ in this country the likes of Spurgeon in the late 19th century preached regularly to thousands but since then there has been a steady decline and I take comfort in the fact that it isn't just because I'm not a very good Christian or a very good preacher it is because people do not want to hear the gospel generally speaking anymore and we are in a time when very very few indeed will pay any attention to the gospel if you want some more evidence of that sean goes out and mimi goes out pretty much every sunday and they've gone out pretty much every sunday since they've been here which is maybe 18 months every single sunday and almost every sunday when i go up with sean he talks to several people sometimes at length none of those people has ever darkened these doors people have promised us that they will come they don't come sometimes they've prayed with with um sean to receive the lord but they've never darkened these doors and uh you know we need to pray for sean and mimi we need to pray that sean won't get discouraged i'm used to it but even i can get discouraged at times but this just illustrates the stubbornness the hardness and the indifference that is upon the people just now even here in Dudley and this tells me because hardly anyone is responding that the, ch the church will very soon be taken out let me give you a verse in support of that um, just to show you that this is not just my idea but it's Bible Isaiah 57 
Isaiah 57 and in times like these I'm glad you've come I would I probably wouldn't preach if there was only me and the wife we just read the Bible at home so I'm glad that one or two people have come Isaiah 57 and verse 1 the righteous perisheth and no man layeth it to heart and merciful men are taken away none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come I uh, used to listen to Pat Curry a lot Pat Curry was a passionate man Pat Curry was a godly man Pat Curry was a man who lived a clean and upright life he was a pleasure to be around on those few occasions I spent time with him and he was grieved then this was when did he go to the Lord 2000 17 years ago he was grieved then at the state of the nation I don't know if you could have born to see what we have to see now and he was taken away from the evil to come and of course it also suggests it speaks of the church that's going to be taken out before the rapture comes but if this is true then you'd expect a decline in numbers when the judgment is about to fall it's always been the same I think this is what the Bible teaches but let's look more closely then at tonight's passage Exodus chapter 10 and verse 21 and the Lord said unto Moses stretch out thine hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt even darkness which may be felt the darkness comes at the Lord's command because of fear it's the Lord who sends this darkness and it was because of Pharaoh's obstinacy that judgments have, been, have become progressively heavier. The first cause of this darkness is Pharaoh's hard heart. And the darkness is God's response. God didn't send the darkness first. God sent a messenger first. God sent the truth first. I remember Jack Mormon saying when he was here, truth always speaks first. And this seems to be so in the Bible. Adam and Eve were first spoken to by the Lord and then the devil came. And this seems to be the way of things. When, um, was it Ahab, wanted to go and fight against um, and recover Ramoth Gilead from the Syrians and he invites King Jehoshaphat to go with him. And all the false prophets are telling him, telling the king, because they're all yes men, false prophets are always yes men, telling the king, go up, go up, you'll prosper, you'll take it and so forth. And, um, and Jehoshaphat who is a comparatively godly king says to Ahab isn't there a prophet of the Lord here and Ahab says well there's Micaiah but I hate him because he never prophesies good of me but evil so they send for Micaiah and all the prophets are there loads of them and they're all saying bless the, you know, praise the king go and do it go up go up and Micaiah says if you go up you'll die God sent him the truth he ignored the truth and he died now you might argue perhaps that in that case the, the liars spoke first but I'm not so sure because the king said I hate him he'd already heard prophet Micaiah's prophecies sadly you know we're seen as doom mongers because judgment is coming I was listening to a man yesterday an Anglican, typical Anglican um, almost trying to paint the world as a lovely place and uh, as far as the trees and the flowers and the sky go amen to that but as far as the works of men and the conduct and character of men is concerned, it's anything but a lovely place. And uh, this man is, you know, uh, well, really, just prattling on about really the world is, you know, we ought to enjoy the world and, and so on. Now, maybe I'm overstating, maybe I'm misrepresenting him slightly, but, you know, if he'd taken the kind of position that I take, the kind of position that Jeremiah took, that judgment is coming, he's, he's seen as a party pooper. That's not popular. But judgment is coming. The darkness is already here and it's going to get deeper. But the first cause is Pharaoh's hard heart. The darkness is God's response. The power of the devil in bringing darkness upon men is not the issue. Don't get obsessed by the power of Satan. The Lord's in control. That's the teaching of scripture from start to finish. I believe, and I was going to say to you before I began this message, that Satan has has had a crack at this church this last 12 months and one or two people have, have gone down under the, under the blow and I believe he's had a particular go at me also these last six months um, 
because we were thriving we were prospering numbers were growing and so I think the devil has come in and he's got to one or two people and we're not seeing them anymore um, but nevertheless the Lord's in control the principal parties are God and man and then in verse 22 here in Exodus 10 we continue and Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days we studied the subject of three days fairly recently on one Sunday night and this of course was the time that the Saviour was in the heart of the earth according to his own testimony comparing what he was about to do with the time that Jonah the three days and the three nights that Jonah spent in the heart of the earth and the saving work of Jesus from resurrection from death excuse me to resurrection was three days and three in the Bible is the number of fullness I've said ten is the number of completeness it completes the cycle but three is often the number of fullness there are three persons in the Trinity you are a threefold being you are body, soul and spirit or should I say more correctly spirit, soul and body and uh, three is the number of fullness and Christ made a full atonement in three days and three days here um, in Exodus 10 perhaps represents the fullness of judgment the darkness came for three days now hell of course for a lost man will be more than three days but it will be full judgment look with me to Jude that's your penultimate book Jude chapter thir- sorry verse 13 verse 13 of Jude and uh Jude has this to say speaking of false teachers raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever how fearful that is the blackness of darkness forever and most of the people that live in your street and most of the people that live in my street are heading tonight for that blackness of darkness and when they get in there it will be forever it's a fearful fearful thought look at uh, Revelation chapter 14 just go right down into Revelation and chapter 14 and verse 11 and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name they have no it's forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night this is horrible this is horrible this is hell perhaps somebody rubbed you up the wrong way today perhaps somebody was poisonous and unpleasant towards you today and perhaps sometimes you know it, 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 our, our hearts answer that there's an echo sometimes there's, it's like, it's like uh, you know sometimes when a singer sings it can break the glass and sometimes when, when we meet with that kind of poison and we meet with that it stirs it in us too but we need to remember that godless people are going to that place of darkness forever and I think if we can remember that we can have compassion even when we're insulted and we should do and I've said from this platform many many times two reasons I like to take tracts out one is because Jesus is worth knowing and heaven is a wonderful place but the other is the alternative is absolutely fearful verse 23 then continuing in Exodus chapter 10 verse 23 they saw not one another neither rose any from his place for the for three days but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings they saw not one another in this darkness it's rather like Adam and, he, Adam and he, Eve who hid from one another because of their sin lost men suppose they have friends but they never really know each other generally speaking my experience has been that friends last about 10 years if it it goes well they might last 10 years but we change they change I change we don't have the same things in common anymore and it's been the experience all my life but last men you know they suppose they have friends but they never really know each other I fear in fact I'm sure they don't they never really see each other 
they saw not one another they only see the actor the Lord Jesus constantly charged people with being hypocrites and apparently the Greek word hypocrites means an actor on the stage and uh, you know we, we it's so easy to put on a facade to present ourselves in a particular way and the Lord Jesus never did that so what you saw with the Saviour was what you got WYSIWYG we used to say back in the days of computing what you say is what you get WYSIWYG and with the Lord Jesus there was no facade it was real you saw the man and what's, what's more he saw you and that was why they couldn't stand his company because he knew he saw right through them he saw right through the facade he saw the little man inside as Herbert Rauch used to say and he loved that little man inside but men couldn't bear the light and we read also they saw not one another neither rose any from his place for three days now a sinful man can never do any work for God the saviour says in John's gospel chapter 15 and verse 5 without me ye can do nothing and for three days we find neither rose any from his place for three days all the time a man lives without the light of the world the Lord Jesus Christ he can do nothing they don't know one another they can't see one another sinful men don't know what man's made of he don't know what his family's made of he don't know what his wife's made of or she doesn't know what he's made of they don't know one another and uh, they can't work nothing valuable but this was the heading for our subject tonight but all the children of Israel had a light in their dwellings and that's great news for us I'm just going to show you one or two references about this light that have really blessed me this last week or two first is in 1st Thessalonians 1st Thessalonians in chapter 5 so Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians and then Thessalonians 1st Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 4 but ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief ye are all the children of light and the children of the day we are not of the night nor of darkness the children of Israel have light in their dwellings and you've got light in yours I trust we all know the Lord here tonight I, I imagine we do, I believe we do then you have light in your dwelling you have light in your heart you've got the scriptures, you've got the saviour so easy to get morose about the darkness with which we're surrounded remember the light, remember you have the light you're in the light John's Gospel chapter 1 John's Gospel chapter 1 and verse 4 speaking of the saviour in him was life and the life was the light of men and then further on in John chapter 8 John chapter 8 verse 12 then spake Jesus again unto them saying I am the light of the world he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life somebody had a hit some years ago with a song called Reasons to be Cheerful uh, some of you might remember it, Derek might remember it it's a good few years back, Reasons to be Cheerful here's a reason to be cheerful he that followeth in me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life I sometimes listen to an alternative news broadcast and much of what they say is true I'm sure politically but really they're just men in the dark trying to find answers not knowing the darkness has come because of the darkness of their hearts and people look in all kinds of places for answers and they they see things wrong in society and they see things wrong in the world and they can get depressed by the darkness and so can you and I but he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life let's look at another place Psalm 119 Psalm 119 
119 is a great psalm of course that constantly mentions the word of God in every verse as a reference of some sort to God's word or his judgments and Psalm 119 and verse 105 thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path the people around us are in the dark the world is in the dark they don't know whether they, where they came from some of them think they came up from the primordial ooze some of them think they came as a result of the big bang they've got no idea where they came from and sadly and regrettably they've got no idea where they're going that's for sure and they don't even know where they are and the strange thing is they don't ask the question but thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path I know where I came from I came from Adam created by God I know that I live in the presence of the Lord in him we live and move and have our being and I know where I'm going thank God I don't deserve any of it I don't deserve the glory that's coming but all this is to the glory of God because he loved me and gave himself for me and the more I think about my rottenness the more I thank God for his love and his cross because without that I'd be in that blackness of darkness forever and so would you it's a tragedy it really is a tragedy that men and women that call themselves Christians can't find their way to church once a week to give thanks to God for their salvation one wonders if they have it sometimes you know this really is a reason to be cheerful Christ loved me and gave himself for me and whatever darkness the men, the men of the world might be troubled by we have light in our dwellings I want you to take that one thought away tonight don't let the darkness that's all around you get you down thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path they uh, the men of today as it was in Egypt they have every reason to be despondent about the current darkness but they will blame everyone but themselves and if a man's in darkness it's his own fault it's not the devil's fault it's his fault if a man's miserable it's not the devil's fault it's his fault godly people generally speaking are cheerful I don't know where that leaves me I don't ask Jean about it it might not come out in my favour but godly people generally are cheerful it's a mark of wisdom says one old commentator uh, constant cheerfulness is a mark of wisdom and he means biblical wisdom we have so much to be thankful for just that one great central truth that Christ has saved us that is such a wonderful thing to be thankful for no matter what is going on in the world so different listen to this Anglican just five minutes five minute cameo on YouTube almost trying to make the world acceptable to us and then I listen to James Knox for five minutes you can stick the world up your jumper more or less is what James Knox says I hate the place I'm looking forward to going that's more like a biblical testimony to my mind doesn't mean we hate people James Knox doesn't hate people he's very keen on soul winning very very keen if you've had any familiarity with his, with his writings or his church we've got no time for the world and that's the right that's the bible attitude if you understand tonight that the world is facing the same destruction as Egypt and it is you might turn your eyes upon Jesus instead Ecclesiastes chapter in fact I can't remember the chapter it's definitely Ecclesiastes maybe chapter 7 or chapter 10 truly the light is sweet and it is a pleasant thing for the eyes to behold the sun I put a little blog on my book site this week I was out I think Wednesday morning I think it was going for the walk around the park and there was some blue sky and boy was it just uplifting just wonderfully clear blue sky you don't see it very often because of the chemtrails but I think it was Wednesday morning and I just found myself thanking God for it because it just so cheers you up and Solomon said so the light is sweet it's a pleasant thing for the eyes to behold the sun 
But if that natural light is sweet, if that blue sky is sweet, how much more sweet will be the sight of the Saviour, the light of the world, the glory of God. How much more wonderful will that be? That's coming for us. That's coming for us. I'll close with Paul's exhortation again to the Thessalonians. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, please. And here we'll wrap things up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Pray for me tonight because I've no idea what I'm preaching about tomorrow. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If I get up too early, I'll fall asleep while I'm trying to pray, so I value your prayers. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 to conclude. And we're reading from verse 5. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Amen. The children of Israel had light in their dwellings, a thick darkness in Egypt that could be felt, it says in one place, but the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Have you got some light? <laughs> You've got the Bible, if you've got the Bible, you've got some light right there. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. May the Lord encourage us. Amen. Amen.